All right. Thank you, Tim. Awesome, awesome. <clears throat> well, this is um, our first um, Advent Sunday, um, so I'm excited to get out of Ephesians for a little while and uh, begin talking about Christmas. And Advent is this word that comes from the Latin word Adventus, and it means coming, right? And so we're, we're celebrating the coming of Christmas, which points to the coming of someone, right? And it's not Santa, it's Jesus, okay? So we're, at this Advent time is, is pointing to the coming of our Savior, coming, pointing to, this, to the coming of our Messiah, the Mashiach, uh, as he's called in the, in the Old Testament in Hebrew. So I had this great um, video that we're going to watch from the Bible Project that introduces the idea of Messiah, but we can't watch that today. Um, so I am going to pray for us real quick, and then we'll talk about Messiah and then jump into our passage, which is Isaiah 7, verse 14. So let's pray. Father, thank you um, for uh, this season. It is a season of hope, and today we celebrate um, our hope in you. And so, Father, we pray, Lord, as we open your scriptures and we look at the prophecies and we try and understand complicated things, God, I pray that you would give us insight, that you, that you yourself, in fact, would, would speak to our hearts and bring us hope. For those who have lost hope, Father, for those who um, their hopes have been maybe crushed, Lord, I pray that the light of Jesus uh, would be their hope. God, we thank you for, for your word today, and we bless you in the name of Jesus. Amen, amen. So the, in the, the video, it was going to take us back to, to Genesis chapter 3, and I believe it's verse 15, but I will find it as we turn there together. Genesis 3, 15. So this is after the fall of Adam and Eve. The serpent has deceived them, and uh, God says to the serpent, uh, because you've done this, cursed are you above all livestock and all beasts of the fields, and on your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. And here's 15, and I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring, and he shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. So all the way in the beginning, uh, there's this prophecy of someone who is to come, uh, someone, the seed of the woman, who is going to stand up to the serpent. And kind of in this epic battle, he's going to crush the serpent's head. But in the process, the serpent is going to bite his heel. And, uh, and so we have this, this idea that begins in the beginning of Genesis, that someone is coming, someone is coming. If we look uh, maybe into 1 Samuel, let me see if I can just kind of go there. First, or 2 Samuel 7, God gives a promise to David that he would set David on the throne and that his kingdom would last forever. And that there's going to be one that's going to come and is going to sit on that throne. And he's going to bring peace. He's going to bring prosperity. And so this idea of Messiah begins to, to fill out the one who is coming, the one who is coming. And they're looking and they're waiting and waiting and waiting. This morning, we're going to look at a, um, a passage that, that I grew up hearing, hearing about the virgin birth, hearing about Isaiah talking about this, this woman is going to conceive and she's, going to, going to, going to, and she's a virgin and she's going to give birth to a child and this child's going to be called Emmanuel. And so um, what I wanted to do in this series is basically go back to some of those really well-known prophecies that we all grew up with, and we would go, yeah, yeah, that's, that's the one, and it points back to, or, or it points forward to Jesus, and really kind of unpack the, uh, the original uh, prophecy. What, it, what, what was the context of that prophecy? Who said that? Why did they say it? And so we're going to look at some of these prophecies that we go, oh, yeah, that's about Jesus, but it was first given to someone in the Old Testament during a particular time and in a particular, there was a particular something that was happening during the time. And what was that? So we're going to look at that and see how that connects to what Matthew says in Matthew 1, uh, 20, 
22 and 23, or 23 and 24, and he, where he refers back to this, and he says, this is Jesus, all right? Now, my theme, I always like to have a theme for, for a series, and so my theme for this series would be uh, Luke 24, 25 through 27, and Jesus is, is uh, speaking here, and he's speaking to two disciples on the road to Emmaus. Now, they don't know that it's Jesus, right? They, they've met this guy along their, their travel to Emmaus, and they invite him to, to join them. And they begin this discussion about the things that have been happening in Jerusalem, how Jesus has died, and, 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 uh, and Jesus says this to them. He says, how foolish you are, and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. Can you imagine being there with, with Jesus or with these two disciples and Jesus? And just to hear, I just would love to hear how Jesus went through all of the scriptures, starting with Moses and the prophets, explaining that all of this was pointing to himself. Man, that would have been, that's a sermon that you don't want to miss. You don't want to be sick on that Sunday. Uh, and, and so in that vein, I just kind of wanted to go back and say, well, what are these prophecies and what do they mean? How do they point to the Messiah? So this week, uh, we lit the hope candle. And so I started thinking about hope this week. And it, uh, it was, you know, I wanted to preach from this idea of hope. I wanted, and so I started asking myself this question, um, what do I hope in? Where is my hope today? And it was a hard question. I was kind of like, well, I don't know. I just couldn't, I couldn't get, find the teeth, you know, to, to sink into, where is my hope? Um, and I ran across this, this quote from Charles Spurgeon. He said, hope itself is like a star, not to be seen in the sunshine of prosperity, and only to be discovered in the night of adversity. And I went, you know what, that's true. That is true. Sometimes when things are going right, it's, it's hard to see the hope because it's like looking for a star when the sun is out. It's like, uh, yeah, I know it's out there somewhere. I just can't really grab onto it. But in the night, when it's dark, boy, sometimes that star of hope just shines. And that's what we need. That's what we need. So wherever you are this morning, for me, I kind of, just spent the, the, the holidays with my, uh, with my daughter and my son-in-law, and, and my son was here, and it was a time of rejoicing and, and uh, enjoying their company and eating way too much food. And so, you know, for me, I was like, well, what do I hope in? I was like, well, things aren't that bad right now. Things, are, things were good. But I do want to establish, I do want to know what my hope is. Because just as sure as the sun shines during the day, you know, night is always coming. And there's always a time when there will be a struggle. There will be a time of despair. There will be a time that it is, and that's why we need hope, right? We need hope because there are times in our life when, when we struggle. And despair seems like this quicksand that, that's just pulling us down. And, and our hope is like us just... We're just reaching out for anything that's stable, anything that'll give us resistance against that. That's kind of grabbing for hope everywhere we can to somehow pull against that pull of despair. That's what hope is good for. That's why we need hope. In the, in the Hebrew, there are two words for hope. One is kawa, which means to wait. And it has this idea of waiting for something that, that is specific, a specific expectation, a specific fulfillment, um, like, uh, you know, you're, you're, you have this hope that the mechanic can fix your car and that your car will work. It has a specific goal in mind, you know. I'm really hoping that he can find the problem. And then there's another word that is, that is uh, yahal, which is very close, but it doesn't have a specific thing that it's focused on. It's just kind of a broad and general hope, a hope of something better, a hope of something more. 
And both of these words uh, come from this idea or this metaphor uh, of a stretched string, which is what kwa or kwa is. That's the noun in Hebrew that those words come from. So the, the metaphor is that, that the tension that we feel if we stretch a string out as we anticipate something, some type of future event, some type of thing that we have our hope in. That we're, there's this tension, there's this stretching in that waiting. And that's what our hope is. Now, for the, for the believer, it's not just wishful thinking, right? We're not just hoping on something that we don't have, we don't have a, a knowledge of. It's, for the Christian, the Bible says our hope is this confident expectation during this time of, of stretching as we're waiting because our hope is rooted in Christ, who is our Savior, who is our Messiah. He's the coming one. Listen to Paul as he speaks about our faith uh, and the hope that it generates. Romans 5.1 says, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God. Therefore, since we have been counted righteous by God, and, and, and righteousness has been given to us, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And through him we have also obtained access by faith into this grace by which we stand. We get to, we, we're not just justified and have peace with God, but now we, we have standing with God by his grace that he's given us through Christ. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. We have this hope that we will experience the glory of God. We have this hope that we're going to see the glory of God. Not only that, but we rejoice in our suffering. So this, this idea of hope that it's, that it's in the future, it's, it's, it's it grounded in Christ, it's, it's grounded in us being justified before God, and we know that we're going to stand by His grace. We know that we're going to see His glory, and that's going to be the specific thing. But now, in our sufferings, we know that this suffering produces endurance, and this endurance produces character, and this character produces hope. And that hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that he has given to us. So in this process, until we reach that final destination, we have this hope that that's where we're, where we're headed, far off in the future. But today, we have this hope as we struggle, because we know that God is using those struggles to, to create endurance within us. And that endurance is, is producing some type of character within us. And that character gives us hope of our final destination. So we don't know the specifics about what those sufferings are. We don't know how that's gonna build into us. So there's this vague sense of hope that's in the now and a very specific sense of hope that's in the future. And I just love that, that, that hope does not put us to shame. It's a hope that doesn't disappoint the Christian because his or her hope is in God who never fails. It's not dependent upon you it's not dependent upon me. It's dependent on the work of God to ensure our salvation. We rest in that. We hope in that. It's beautiful. So the Messiah is the promised Savior from Genesis 3.15, the one who crushes the head of the serpent, whose heel is bitten in the process. And today, like I said, we're going to look at Isaiah 7.14. Uh, and for me, it's always been uh, a clear prophecy uh, the virgin birth indicates that Jesus is the Messiah. More than anything, you know, I would go back to this and say, well, well, it says that he's going to be born of a virgin, and that's actually what happened, so he's the one. I mean, like, how could you miss this, right? It seems to be so clear. And I think about the Jewish people who are still looking for the Messiah, and, and I, I wonder, how, how can you not see this? How, how did you miss this? that Isaiah's prophecy is the one that you've been waiting for, that indicates that Jesus is the one that, 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 that is going to bring all of these things to pass. He is your Messiah. And so there, I, I began to look and, and try and understand the Jewish mind and see the, all the different reasons that they're still waiting for the Messiah. For some... Uh, there's two great um, hurdles that, that Jewish people struggle with, and one is the Trinity. 
Um, that there's God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. This is not an Old Testament concept for them. So they struggle with this idea that, that, that God comes in the form of, a, of the Son, and that he's here present on the earth and in heaven at the same time. They also struggle with this idea of, of the God-man, uh, this incarnation. It's, it's just hard for them to, to understand that. They, they also struggle with uh, that there are several prophecies that it seems like Jesus doesn't fulfill. He leaves unaccomplished, like the building of the third temple, uh, the gathering of all the Jews back to the land of Israel. They're still waiting for that. They're waiting for, for, for the Messiah to usher in an era of world peace and end all hatred and oppression and suffering and disease. They're waiting for, for the Messiah to spread uni the universal knowledge of God, which will unite all humanity as one. And those things haven't happened yet. And w as Christians, we see that it was like, oh, he's going to bring that when he comes again. But they're still waiting for that one who will come and bring it in totality. And specifically in this passage... Uh, there are problems uh, that they encounter, like if Jesus was literally born of a virgin, he really can't claim the right to the throne of, of David um, as, the, as the right passes from father to son. And so if he has a virgin birth, there seems to be an interruption in this chain. And they don't see a connection from Isaiah's passage to it being a ma messianic prophecy. So they accuse Matthew of mistranslating the word Alma, which means virgin, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. So there's some big, big problems there, but, but where I want to start is I want to, let's read Isaiah 7, and let's look at this prophecy in the midst of the context, all right? So let's just turn there. Let's turn to Isaiah 7, and I'm just going to start reading through it. Many of you know Isaiah 6, that's where Isaiah has this vision of God, and he's in uh, the throne room of God, and it's just amazing. Almost everybody knows that passage um, from Isaiah, but this is the one that comes directly after it, and it begins in Isaiah 7-1, so if you have your Bibles and you can turn there, I'm just going to read that, and then I'm going to kind of summarize what this passage is all about. It says, in the days of Ahaz, the son of Jotham, son of Uzziah, the king of Judah, Rezin, the king of Syria, and Pekah, the son of Remaliah, the king of Israel, came up to Jerusalem to wage war against it, but could not yet mount an attack against it. And when the house of David was told Syria is in league with Ephraim, the heart of Ahaz and the heart of the people shook as the trees of the forest shake before the wind. And the Lord said to Isaiah, go out to meet Ahaz, you and Shear Jashub, your son, at the end of the conduit of the upper pool on the highway to the washer's field. I love how God is so specific. He goes, I actually know where he is, and you don't have to look for him. He's, that's where he is. Go there. Um, and say to him, be careful, be quiet. Do not fear and do not let your heart be faint because of these two smoldering stumps of firebrands at the fierce anger of Rezin and Syria and the son of Remalia, because Syria and Ephraim and the son of Remalia has devised evil against you, saying, let's go up against Judah and, tes and terrify it, and let us conquer it for ourselves and set up the son of Tabeel as king in the midst of it. Thus says the Lord God, it shall not stand, it shall not come to pass, for the head of Syria is Damascus, and the head of Damascus is Rezin. And within 65 years, Ephraim will be shattered from being a people. And the head of Ephraim is Samaria, and the head of Samaria is the son of Ramalia. If you are not firm in the faith, you will not be firm at all. Again, the Lord spoke to Ahaz, ask a sign of the Lord your God. Let it be deep as Sheol or high as heaven. Basically saying, ask whatever you want. But Ahaz said, I will not ask, and I will not put the Lord to the test. That sounds familiar, familiar doesn't it? And he said, hear then, O house of David, is it too little for you to weary men that you weary my God also? 
And here's the verse that we're going to look at. Here's the prophecy. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and you shall call his name Emmanuel. And he shall eat curds and honey when he knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good. For before the boy knows how to refuse evil and choose the good, the land whose two kings you dread will be deserted. And the Lord will bring upon you and upon your people and upon your father's house such days as have not come since the day that Ephraim departed Judah, the king of Assyria. And then it, it goes on uh, to, to talk in kind of strange ways about, about the destruction that, that, and the, the judgment that's going to happen. And then in 8, um, starting in 8.3, the, the prophecy is fulfilled. And I went to the prophetess, and she conceived and bore a son. Then the Lord said to me, call his name Maher Shahal Hashbaz. For before the boy knows how to cry, my father or my mother, the wealth of Damascus and the spoil of Samaria will be carried away before the king of Assyria. Okay, so what did we just read there, right? Let me kind of break it down and summarize this kind of in... Uh, so, so you have the king of Ahaz, uh, or the king Ahaz, and he is the king of the southern kingdom of Israel. This is Judah, and the capital is Jerusalem. And Ahaz is an evil king. He's not a good king. So immediately I go, why does God want to help him? And he wants to help him to preserve the line of David. See, these other kings say, hey, we'll set up our own guy there. We're going to set up our own guy there. And God says, it will not be. You're not going to do that. So you have these two other kings, King Pekah, who ruled the northern king of Israel, whose capital is Syria, and King Rezin, who's not a Jew. Um, he is uh, the ruler of Aram, or Syria, not Assyria, which is just uh, S-Y-R-I-A, and his capital is in Damascus. And Isaiah is sent to warn Ahaz that these two kings have joined forces to attack. And he tells Ahaz, hey, don't be afraid because God is going to be with you, and the invasion will fail. And then he goes on and he says, and in fact, in 65 years, the northern kingdom of Israel will be taken into exile by Assyria, with an A at the beginning. Now, Ahaz doesn't believe this, and he ignores Isaiah's warning. And how do I know that? Um, because at the end of the, the the verse 9, he says, if you're not firm in the faith, you will not be firm at all. He's speaking directly to, to Ahaz's faith here. He says, are, are you going to believe this that I'm telling you? Because if, you, if, you, if you're not firm in the faith, you're not firm at all. And, and he, says, he says, in fact, go ahead and ask for a sign. Ask God for a sign. And he says, I'm not going to do it. No. And, and that, that his response there is not one of faith like Jesus in the, in the desert, of, of not wanting to test God. This is God himself coming to Ahaz and saying, you asked me for something so I can prove myself to you. And he doesn't, he doesn't ask for one. It's kind of a slap in God's face. And Isaiah tells Ahaz, hey, God's going to give you a sign anyway. And the Lord himself will give you, in the plural, speaking not just to Ahaz, but to the whole house of David. Behold, the Alma, the virgin, shall conceive and give birth to a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. That's Isaiah 7, 14. So, so before this, he, he actually indicates a specific woman here. Because there's an article, it's Ha'alma. So it's the woman, or the young woman, the, 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 the virgin. So he's indicating someone here. And, and, he's, and the, here's, the, here's the prophecy. Before this, uh, this period of time uh, happens, these two kings are going to be destroyed. So here's, and, and, and this is going to be me. This is God being with you. Okay, I'm going to be with you. And I'm going to preserve the, the, the line of David here. Um, and, so, and so we see it fulfilled in the next chapter as, as this child is born to the prophetess, Isaiah's wife. 
and his name is called Maher Shalal Hashbaz, which means the spoil speeds and the prey hastens, right? And, and notice in that verse, uh, 8, 8, 3, it says the riches of Damascus and the spoil of Samaria are going to be carried away before the armies of Sennacherib, the king of Assyria. In fact, in 2 Kings, we do see that fulfilled in 2 Kings 17, 5 and 6, that, that the king of Assyria comes and invades the, the entire country and takes exile Israel. So how do I know that this woman in 8 is actually the woman he's referring to? In Isaiah 8, 18, he says, Behold, I and the children whom God has given me are for signs and wonders in Israel. So he's actually saying, you know what, I'm a prophet. I've been given to, as a sign to Israel, but also my children that God has given me, they are signs to Israel. So in, in close, if, reading it in context, it's like you see that, that, the, that, the, that the prophetess gives birth and then it comes true. This, this prophecy comes true, which is a good thing for Isaiah because in the Old Testament, if the prophecy of the prophet doesn't come true, they stone him. Now, how is this a sign of the Messiah? How does it get from this prophecy in the Old Testament into the New Testament where Matthew in Matthew 1, 22 and 23 says, All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet, prophet Isaiah. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. If we look in Luke 1, 31 through 35, similarly, we get a piece of the story which indicates that Mary was a virgin when she uh, she, uh, conceived Jesus. And it says, and behold, this is the angel speaking to Mary, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, and he will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. So it doesn't really seem like there's a problem for God that this virgin birth is going to separate this line of David. And I'm not really going to go into that, but I, 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 when I read that here, I go, oh, okay, well, that's, that's not really a problem, or at least not for the angel. And Mary said to the angel, how will this be since I'm a virgin? And the angel answered her and said, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child will, to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth, in her old age, old age has also conceived a son, and this is the sixth month with her who was called barren. And then this line, which is beautiful, for nothing will be impossible with God. I love that. Nothing is impossible with God. Because there would be some who would see this sign and say, well, that's not even possible. We know how sexual reproduction works, and while there are Some creatures that can do that alone, humans are not one of them. In fact, this has never happened in the course of history, not that I know of. This is special. This is unique. And God is the one who has accomplished this. Why would he make this child's birth so significant if the child itself wasn't significant? It points, for me, this points to the Messiah so clearly. But there's a problem here, and it's a mistranslation problem, some say, because in Isaiah's passage, the word Alma means young woman. It actually, it's, as with every Hebrew word, there is a range of meaning, okay? Greek is very specific, but, but Hebrew is more poetic, and so there's a range of meaning. And so, while it can mean a virgin, it's not specific to mean vir- a virgin. It is, its basic primary uh, meaning is related to adolescence, that it's a young woman, and it has, doesn't have any specific um, um, relation to sexual chastity. 
Although it can mean that within its range of meaning, because certainly most young women should be virgins. So, and then, so there's some uh, uh, Jewish scholars who would say, well, actually, the word that he was looking for, if he meant virgin, was petu- betula. But when I looked into this range, the range of meaning of betula, it was even wider. And it included uh, not just young women and virgin, but also a young pregnant woman as well. And the usage seemed to be just as vague. So I began to think, and I was like, well, maybe Alma is the perfect word. And maybe Isaiah or God speaking through Isaiah used it on purpose. And perhaps Matthew, with Mary's testimony, understood how the prophecy would work, okay? So now we have to talk about prophecy and how prophecy works, okay? And see if it actually fits in with this range of, of, of meaning with this, with this word. Uh, sometimes a prophecy ends up being more complex than it first appears. Prophecies are mysterious. They give us specifics, but they don't give us all the specifics, do they? Um, For example, like God tells Moses in in Exodus 3, he says, I'm going to bring Israel out of Egypt, and I'm going to bring him into the promised land. That seems pretty specific. What he doesn't tell Moses is that you're going to wander for for 40 years. This is not going to be a straight shot. What he doesn't tell Moses in this prophecy is that this whole generation that's leaving Egypt, they're going to die in the wilderness. doesn't tell him that. He doesn't tell him about any of the other obstacles or incidents on the way. He just tells him, I'm going to take them out. He doesn't tell Moses that, hey, you're not going to get to enter into the land. You're just going to be able to see it. Or in 2 Samuel, and we talked about this, uh, God's promise to David that he would set David on his throne and that his kingdom would last forever. And David must have said, yes, that's awesome. That means that all my kids are going to be awesome kings, maybe even better than me. And, and this is, my kingdom's just going to roll throughout history. It's going to last forever. But what David isn't told is that a lot of the kings that come after you, not going to be great. Actually, most of them are going to be bad eggs. They're not going to be good. Nothing is mentioned to David that the kingdom will be divided. Nothing is mentioned to kingdom about the Gentile powers that he's going to have to struggle with. The destruction of Jerusalem or the destruction of the temple. It doesn't say anything about that. It doesn't talk about an interruption in David's line for 400 years. And similarly, in this passage in Isaiah 7:14. There is a child that's born in Ahaz's day, and it serves as a sign that God is with him and is going to deliver Israel. That happens. But it doesn't say anywhere in there that the deliverance isn't going to last, and it doesn't last. It doesn't say that Ahaz is going to not continue to be evil, because he does continue to be evil. And we're not told that the kingdom, uh, the kingdom doesn't last. This, this right here, which they could have seen as like, oh, now this is great. Prosperity is coming. Things are going to be good for us. But that, that prosperity is not going to last. So how do we connect this to what is happening in Matthew? How do we make that, this a messianic prophecy? Certainly not, we're not told everything. Um, that's going to happen. We're just told a piece and a part. And then we have to look at uh, what's called a dual fulfillment of prophecy. That prophecy can be fulfilled once, but it can also be fulfilled again. And that the first fulfillment is a close and maybe a partial um, fulfillment, or it's temporal, it's temporary. Or sometimes two different prophecies are grouped together but have separate outcomes. And then if the first one is temporary and close and partial, the second often completes the first and has an ultimate fulfillment, an ultimate fulfillment in Christ or in the kingdom of God. It has an eternal or a spiritual kind of fulfillment. 
Um, this is how the Old Testament um, is, is in the New Testament revealed. But it's also how the Old Testament is in the New Testament, but it's concealed. Okay, and we see these ties of how, and that's Augustine saying those, those things, that the, that the New Testament and the Old Testament are connected and often connected in prophecy. So the messianic hope was for an ultimate descendant of David who would finally fulfill the original promise that God gave to David. He delivered us from being separated from God, and now he can be God with us. Um, so Matthew is, is seeing this and understanding this kind of in hindsight, that this prophecy was being fulfilled, and Jesus, who is God with us, it, it, and also the God who brings, it, also the one who brings God to us, okay? So, so I think he understands, basically, this is really hard to, and I'm trying to kind of bring all of this together. I think that he understood Alma, this young, this term young woman, as a young woman in Isaiah's time, and Alma in the more miraculous and unique meaning as a virgin in his time that would bring hope and confidence that this is the child that would be the fulfillment of everything God promised in the Messiah. So, this morning, I, that, that's kind of, kind of goes through the problem and kind of ties it, tries to tie it together. But here's, here's the thing I don't want you to miss this morning. Despite all the controversy, this name is where our hope is found, Emmanuel. Spurgeon says, God is near, therefore hope is near. The ultimate hope comes when we know Emmanuel. In the Hebrew, im is with, nu is us, El is short for Elohim, which is God. With us, God. And that is our hope. That is the hope that this passage brings, that, that there is one who has come and he is our hope. Even now in our waiting and in our suffering, even in injustice and in persecution, he is with us. God is with us eternally. He's going to come again, and that is our hope. He, he's going to come, and he's going to make all things right. The hope that sin for me will finally be eliminated is a great hope. The hope that judgment will bring justice for every injustice. The hope that every tear will be wiped away. That is what Emmanuel means. So don't be fooled into looking for a better hope. There are many hopes out there that promise that we don't have to wait, that satisfaction can be now. We call these things idols, things in my life that I, that I, I tend to grab onto because I think that they're going to satisfy me now, and I don't have to wait. They're false hopes. They promise me peace, but that peace doesn't last. And so my, my desire now is that I would reject every false hope because Emmanuel is my only hope. He is the one who was coming and who is coming again. He came into the world, like I said, in a very unique and miraculous way. And he leaves the world in a very unique and miraculous way. The Messiah, the one that we've been waiting for, he comes in a virgin birth, and he's raised again to new life and ascends into heaven. No one has ever done these things. How could we miss this? For me, as I read Matthew, I think Matthew got it right. I think Matthew looked at Isaiah's passage and he said, this can only be referring to this man that I, I've come to know, who called me out of the marketplace, who made me his disciple when I was a tax collector. He gave me new life. He is God with us, and he is my hope. And he desperately wants his Jewish brothers to believe this. He desperately wants us to believe this. And just remember, nothing is impossible with God. 
Um, this, this morning, that's where I want my hope to be. And, and yeah, things may be good. Uh, Thanksgiving is just in my rearview mirror. Christmas is, is before me, and I feel like things are good. But that's where I want my hope to be found. But that's not where everybody is. And certainly to this morning, if your hope has faltered or has been replaced or if it's faded, your hope can be renewed. Place your hope in Jesus. Um, man, and if you don't know Jesus, and this could be the very first time that you put your hope in him, you could find forgiveness, you could find, uh, you could find uh, surrender, you could find redemption in him as your Lord and Savior. Man, I'd love to talk to you after the service. We're going to go into a time of, of re- uh, reflection and response uh, to this morning and the hope that we have. Um, so let me pray, and then we'll go right into that time. But if you want to talk to me afterwards, definitely let's talk. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for your word, Lord. It is complex, and, and, and there are a lot of questions. I wish prophecy made more sense, God, but it seems like I'm just... I'm trying to pull things together and try and understand what you're doing in the course of history. That's what we're all trying to do, Father. And I feel very confident, Lord, that, that this is what you're doing. That as we await Christmas and celebrating the coming of Jesus as our Messiah, God, that we have not got it wrong. My hope is secure. My hope is is grounded in this Messiah, in Jesus, who is God with us. We thank you for that. We thank you for the revelation, Lord, that you bring to our hearts, that you show us this. Lord, and I pray that our hope would be secure in you, and I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. So, that was, um, I was hoping that 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 would be easier to explain, but it was, it's hard to explain uh, and make these connections. Something I grew up with um, and just thought was, oh yeah, well that's just the way that it is. And then you start doing research and it's like, well, that's, that is hard. That's, that prophecy is hard. But I do think that the fulfillment, after doing all the work, it still is a big arrow that points to Jesus for me. So, let me hear your response this morning. What, what do you guys think? And I think that, um, I don't know, maybe, maybe we can hear from Zoom land like in the speakers today. I have no idea, um, but, uh, but we'll see. Oh, the microphone. So I don't have to repeat back what everybody says. All right. Can you help me out this morning, please? Thank you. Man. Casper Families comes to the rescue. Kristen, right here on the front row. I just want to give more of a testimony of... I just want to give more of a testimony of um, how God has become my hope this year. Um, the beginning of the year, I committed to read through the Bible, and then work got really busy, and I set it aside around the beginning of March. And this year, and um, just world events, um, the stress of moving probably and not having those connections um and god just get i had been praying for years just to lose my attraction with entertainment and um he had given me that i'm just so overwhelmed with everything that's going on and so obsessed by it and um my my whole core was rocked i was in a really bad place and not many of you probably saw that but um bart definitely did um, God reminded me of my commitment to be in his word. 
And so I did the calculations. What, how much would I have to read in order to finish the Bible this year? And I had to read four times the rate to get it done. But in that, I learned his character, I learned his promises, I learned um, how he has been faithful to his people over and over again. And yes, things can get really, really ugly, um, but he holds them together. He is with them. He is Emmanuel, and he restored my hope. It's knowing him and his word and his character. So we, we can't just set the book aside. We have to be immersing ourselves in it. Um, this year has definitely proven that. It can rock us. And um, being in the psalm study with the women, too, has been amazing just to dig. And so I just, as a testimony, it, it has proven true. His word is alive and active. He reveals himself by his word. He became my hope. And so I just, I, I just exhort everyone to, to dig, to go there. Sorry. No, no, that's good. That's good. And, and we're going to... We're going to start the new year uh, reading uh, the, the Bible together, uh, and so um, just want to put that out there. Um, we'll be using um, uh, Kristen's, uh, some of her resources that she's using right now that I've been listening to and just really enjoying, and so I'm just going to put that out there so that many of you will, will join me in reading the Bible uh, in 2021, and, and we'll do it together, and we'll get... In, we'll start off in the beginning and we'll get all the way to the end and it will be good and we'll, we'll grow in that and we'll learn in that and we'll go to some of these passages that you have probably never even knew existed in the Bible and, uh, and have a good explanation, a good understanding as we do that. So I'm excited for that. Danny back there and then the, here's, uh, here's Tim in the front. Thank you, Ms. Kristen. That was just beautiful. Absolutely encouraging and heartfelt and challenging as well. Um, you, you know, I, I, when, we thought, when we talk of hope, um, it kind of gets intertwined with, with faith because our faith is in hope. And I look forward to the day, and I'm so hopeful for this, that we all will meet hope face to face, and we will no longer need hope because it's there, present with us. So mm. that encouraged me, and we, you're right. We have to persevere through all this. We have to press on through all the tension, all the anxiety, all of the voices in us saying, ah, are you really sure about this? But more than ever, especially this, this time of year, I just am in fire for it. I love it. So carry on, young man. You're doing a great job. All right. Tim up here in the front. Um, I, something I love about the, the point you made in, in the passage is, you know, as a human being, we look at the passage, particularly in Matthew, where it's, uh, it goes with the, the virgin term, and it, it, you look at that, as, and, and that's what draws our eye, right? It's like, oh, wow, that's amazing. How can that happen? Um, but kind of what, as you sort of walk us through this, in the end, that, that's almost secondary. God can bring, you know, the incarnation about however he wants. But it's the incarnation, it's, it's God with us that ends up being what hits hard. That's what ends up mattering, is it's, it's the part that you kind of hand wave over if you, if you aren't, it's like, oh, and he'll be called, you know, God with us in some sort of gauzy, general, sort of esoteric sense. But no, that's the part that was real and, and deep and is what ends up mattering eternally, is God with us. Um, whereas, again, as a human being, we, we're, good, we're completely going to miss the part that matters, which is why we, I think we just need to trust and not stress about, you know, it's really easy to get pulled into looking at prophecies and, and trying to, well, there's a lot of people right now getting pulled into, uh, you know, weird stuff where they're looking into the Bible to try to match up whatever's happening in the Pennsylvania vote count or whatever, um, or, or, you know, even weirder things than that right now. And a lot of Christians are getting sucked into it when they just need to trust that God knows what he's doing and we can trust his word, and we can trust that God is with us. Yeah, and what a promise, too. 